Hi, I'm Femi OK. You're watching the stream. Do you remember back in February when there was a military coup in Myanmar? Huge street protests really uh, took part in Myanmar, all across Myanmar, and really took over the headlines at the same time. And then those protests seemed to stop. A new film from the Al Jazeera 101 East team investigates what happened to the protesters who dared to take on the military junta. This is Myanmar, State of Fear. to the military's ambition to build a surveillance state in Myanmar. Joining us to talk about what is happening in Myanmar, particularly when it comes to protesters and people who are dissenting against the military hunter, Ali, Wenin and Thin. Good to have you here on the stream. Ali, welcome back to the stream. Will you remind our audience who you are, what you do? Thanks. Yes, I'm a journalist and reporter. I, uh, for the last 10 years, um, uh, was based in Myanmar, or for almost 10 years, for nine and a half years. Um, and then after the military coup happened at the time I was uh, had been reporting for Al Jazeera News and also doing some work with 101 East. Um, but unfortunately, um, due to the extreme uh, crackdown that happened very shortly after the coup, um, crackdown on protesters, but also crackdown on journalists, I was forced to leave the country um, and I moved back to the UK, which is where I'm originally from, uh, but have tried to continue working on Myanmar. I have a lot of friends still there, obviously spent a large part of my adult life there. A lot of friends, um, colleagues, loved ones still there, still taking risks. Uh, I'm still going to introduce your, your co-panelists as, as well. We have a whole show, <laughs> but I have to say hello yeah. to the other panelists as well. Wayne, in welcome to the stream. Will you introduce yourself to our international audience? Go ahead. Uh, thank you. My name is Wei Nin and I'm a Burmese uh, human rights activist. Uh, I have been advocating for human rights and democracy in Burma for over 10 years. So, uh, it, you know, naturally is a hard work, but since 1st of February, it's really been a very devastating time and heartbreaking time for all of us. Mm -hmm. Good to have you. Hello, Thin. Welcome to the stream. Introduce yourself to our international audience. Hi, Fermi. Uh, my name is Thin. I am a journalist based in Europe. I was born and raised in Yangon, Myanmar, but I've been living um, abroad for many years. I still go back home very often, um, but now I don't know when will be the next time I'll see my loved ones or be able to visit again. So, audience watching on YouTube, you have seen our guests, you know where they're from. If you have a question for them, particularly about what is happening in Myanmar right now, you can jump onto the YouTube comment section, your comment, your question. I would do my best to include it in this show. I have to also tell you that you may also be seeing images of torture, of people who have been killed. Um, it, it's, it's a very difficult topic. It's a tragic topic. And I need to tell you this, so that if you don't want to watch it right now, you can walk away from the screen. But I really want you to stay. Let me tell you about my Van Tran. Remember at the beginning of the show, I, I said there were these huge street protests. We were watching these brave protesters taking on military, taking on the police. And then what happened to them? Have a listen, have a look. In response to a much more persistent and increasingly violent pro-democracy uprising, the Burmese military, compared to the past, has intensified its crackdown against the opposition. 
Besides shooting and arresting protesters and activists, it has also resorted to conducting aerial bombing and burning of whole villages. So in order to hide these types of mass crackdown, the military has turned to familiar strategies, such as censoring independent media, um, prosecuting and arresting journalists, and banning social media access across the country. And if we wanted to get a really good, accurate idea of what is happening to people who either protested or still try to protest, what would you share with us? Um, well, it's, it's a difficult question because there are so many different situations and also so little mm -hmm. is known about a lot of people who have been arrested. So for some of the protesters who have been detained, who've been taken into custody, um, some of them we know have uh, had charges brought against them, mostly under this very broad little lit written 505 uh, law, mm -hmm. which is part of the penal code. It's now been amended to be even more broad, so it can be applied to almost anyone who's uh, doing anything that's seen as encouraging disobedience in the, in the government or the military, um, which is being very broadly applied to many people. There's many that have been arrested and we've just heard nothing from them. There's several others in hiding. There are people also still organizing small flash protests, um, still coming out onto the streets, taking risks. So there's all sorts of things, all sorts of different situations. Um, I think Wei Nin will know a lot more about um, what's going on currently with especially some of the people who've been detained. Um, mm. But yeah, like I said, information is limited. So once people are taken away, it's difficult to find out uh, more. Waning, go ahead. I think, yes, I think, you know, when people are arrested, uh, the problem is they are being held in incommunicado. So families uh, don't know where they are being held on what their condition is. And there are a lot of reports about uh, people being tortured in detention center. And sometimes, you know, uh, uh, so I spoke to one mother a couple of months ago, and she said she would prefer to have her son in prison rather than getting their body back, because that's the reality. Sometimes they are sending their body back rather than uh, putting people in prison. So, I mean, people are living under harsh reality. Um, you know, it, it, the trials are happening. But the trials are happening inside prison, uh, out of the public yeah. view. Yeah. Families can't attend. And also under military dictatorship, uh, trials are just formalities. And we know that all of, you know, almost all of them will be sentenced under politically motivated charges. Uh, so uh, the numbers of arrests keep, uh, you know, growing every day. And people are really courageous because still protesters are coming out in a flash mob style or creative style. People are still resisting against the coup. Mm -hmm. Then I see you nodding. What do you want to add? Well, I guess, you know, I think one of the things that perhaps that I just want to explain a little bit more when Wayne in just now said, you know, people are just really worried and they would rather have their loved ones in prison because what's been happening over the past four and a half months is that there has been a lot of cases where people were arrested, um, you know, the night before. And then the next day, their families get a call to say, oh, um, your, your your father, your, your son, uh, your daughter just died um, from a heart attack or, you know, from... Spew you know, they will give spurious reasons and then they'll just come back in a body bag, you know. So so and then, of course, the bodies will be bearing signs of torture. Um, this, this is the situation we're, we're, we're talking about. Yeah, I think and I think it's important to remember that Myanmar, you know, is a country that was under a military dictatorship for nearly half a century. And it only opened up literally just a decade ago. And in fact, a civilian government took over only five years ago. Now, this opening wasn't perfect, but it was something. And it gave people in Myanmar the kind of freedom that they hadn't known for decades. And now in just four and a half months, the hunter has dragged the country back by decades and people are now living in constant fear of the military. So, you know, the, the fact that people are still protesting, it, like, you know, Wayne said, it's, it's just amazing. The courage is, is just, it's, 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 you know, astounding, but it's also extremely worrying because the military, the violence from the military has not let up. In fact, it has actually worsened. I want to go to a clip from Myanmar's state of fear. One of the things that Ali and the 101 
East team did was they were using video from protesters, from families who were getting their bodies back of uh, loved ones and finding that they'd been tortured. They were sharing this video and there were consequences for them saying what had actually happened. Have a listen, have a look. Those who contradict the official narrative are threatened on state media channels, as was the case involving Zormiat Lin, another NLD official. Authorities claim he jumped off his building while trying to escape arrest, but his family say his body showed signs of torture. Ali, you really dug deep into the instrument of terror, which is the military in Myanmar, and you spoke to former members of the military. What did they tell you? What did you get from speaking to them? Um, they had a lot of insights to offer. I mean, what we really wanted to do is, as as um, the others have mentioned, there's so many rumours, so much fear growing. Um, and what we wanted to do was really answer the question of what was happening to people when they were being detained and, you know, where were they being taken, what was happening. These, these rumours of torture, these people who were turning up dead the next day, um, you know, we wanted to see what the reality was. And that particular case, Ormiat Lin as well, there was uh, a lot of um, conflicting information and some forensic experts had said that, uh, you know, that some of the injuries could have actually been caused by uh, decomposition. So we really wanted to actually find out detailed information about what's going on. And of course, as well as doing video analysis, forensic analysis, we also had to speak to people who really understand how the machine of the military works. And these defectors were really able to offer that. They were able to talk about the security setup. They were able to talk about um, the, the way that the intelligence units uh, work within the military, who's ordering them. There are, of course, police and military both involved in a lot of the arrests, a lot of the beatings, a lot of the uh, detainments that are happening. And, and it's, it hadn't been clear necessarily where the orders were coming from and how much of it was or just organically happening from people on the ground. And that was the kind of insight that they were able to give us. They were able to, to explain that everything was really coming uh, um, under the command of the Sayaka, which is this the chief of um, uh, military security, the office of the chief of the military security. They order really almost all of the arrests, the warrants that we're seeing, that, that because obviously these these arrest numbers are still creeping up. You know, Myanmar may have fallen from the headlines, but we're seeing thousands of people still arrested. We're seeing there are almost 2,000 warrants out for people who are in hiding. And those warrants are coming from this Office of Military Security. So they are really behind that, even if there are police and others involved. And that was thing to, to find out a bit more about that from people who really knew the inside workings of the machine. Wayne, in I want to play this to you because it's um, from somebody who really feels like they understand the psyche of the military, how they work and how they operate. And I want to play this to you, knowing that your father was arrested, was arrested in February. So this is a personal thing for you, not just looking after many people who've been arrested, but you have a family connection. Have a watch of this video and then come immediately off the back of it. When we look at the military itself, they are built with the fear. So the soldiers are, are obedient just because they are fearful of losing their family or their life. They have nothing but just weapons. So that's the main thing. And in the revolution, our duty is to fight back this fear propaganda because our future is bigger than that institution. Uh, the military is using everything they have, especially uh, the violence, to instill fear in people. And they are trying to stop people from speaking out. And, uh, of course, in the beginning, they arrested um, politicians, uh, MPs and government officials and some activists like my dad because they thought they would be able to stop uh, protests from happening. But what we've 
seen is the biggest protest in 30 years. I mean, even on state TV, the military went on to say, if you go out and protest, we're going to shoot you in the head and the back. But it didn't stop people from coming out onto the street and protest because we know that we can't go back to the dark days and we can't live under another military dictatorship. That's uh, that's very clear. And of course, uh, you know, soldiers, um, military generals, some of them will be very wealthy, but, you know, normal soldiers, uh, they don't have anything. Uh, this is their, um, and this is the best way to get education in the country as well, if you come from small villages. And so this is an institution built on fear. And uh, so, uh, but we hope that uh, we will win the revolution, although it's a very long journey and it's been, you know, over four months and we keep seeing people being killed and arrested. So it's getting harder and harder for everyone. And people who are involved in a civil disobedience movement, uh, it's over four months now. They have no income. They are living on the edge of poverty. Mm-hmm. And the humanitarian crisis is worsening in the country. So uh, the situation is getting worse. It's, um, it's heartbreaking. I'm going to go to YouTube because some of our audience would like to speak to you guests as well. This is Brad. Brad, I'm going to put this one to you, Finn. Clearly, protests in Myanmar can only go so far. What other options do the people have available to get their point or their pain across, Finn? Well, I think one of the things that we've already, you know, we are seeing now is that people are taking matter into their own hands. So you've now got all these, you know, um, local militias, what they call people's defense forces um, that are being formed all across the country. And they are now, you know, they're now responding to military's violence uh, uh, with their own, you know, homemade guns. And there's been multiple incidents um, over the last few days um, of fighting in many areas. And also, you know, we're seeing targeted assassinations of local administrators and, and people who are seen as colluding with the hunter of course you know we are that that is a, a slippery slope right because that just creates more violence more conflict and it becomes a vicious cycle so that's a real worry but the people feel um they have absolutely no other options because look we've heard a lot of you know, great statements um, from the United Nations, from the European Union, from the US, the UK, um, a lot of the international community, and yet nothing has actually really changed. The hunter is still in power, still killing people, you know, indiscriminately. Um, And and apart from words, um, there hasn't been anything material from the international community. There has been some sanctions, yes, but, you know, so the people feel they don't really have much options. And I think, you know, the documentary just shows the the, the two things, you know, this mm. blunt force, the blunt violence that the hunt is willing to mete out to its own people, as well as the soft tools of spy technology, a lot of which are supplied by Western companies that they can use. So in addition to just using, you know, physical weapons, they now have um, software and technology and equipment that could monitor people. Um, it's, it's very worrying. Finn, you really tapped into the mood that is online on YouTube right now because so many people are saying, what about sanctions? What's the international community going to do? I want to bring in an extra voice. This is Phil Robertson. Have a listen. Have a look. The Myanmar military has a long history of human rights violations against civilians, against the ordinary people of Myanmar. We've seen it every time they go in the field. The standard operating procedure is to target civilians. Anybody in an area that is considered to be an insurgent area is a target. So that means murder. That means rape. That means torture. That means destruction of property. That means uh, arbitrary arrests. All these things are uh, what the Myanmar military is well known for. And the international community should recognize that the only way to get through to them is to cut off the arms to the military and to impose sanctions now. Wayne in thoughts. I think, you know, what we have to remember is, okay, uh, you know, since the February, Coup, the human rights violations on the ground has, you know, is getting worse and worse. It's, 
is really bad. But the human rights violations in Burma has been happening for many decades. And uh, there is a sense of impunity by the military. And even, you know, in 2017, when the UN found that uh, what happened against the Rohingya minority in Burma is, in fact, a genocide, uh, there was nothing. Uh, there was no accountability and no action was taken. I mean, there were some little sanctions, uh, not effective at all, against the military. So the military really have that sense of impunity. And of course, you know, uh, we saw so many statements after statements. In the beginning, they were really encouraging for us, very good. But um, after a while, it became, it started becoming a joke. Uh, we don't, you know, people in Burma don't even take that seriously anymore because they are the one on the ground risking their lives, knowing that they will be, you know, killed and they will be arrested. But international community, uh, I have to say, is frustratingly slow in taking action against the military. And they have the duty to end this cycle of impunity by holding these generals accountable, not only for the atrocities that they've committed in the past uh, four months, but also for many decades. But they haven't done that yet. So Ali knows what it's like to have to go into hiding. She moved from safe house to safe house, and then eventually it was not safe for her to even be in Myanmar anymore. Ali, uh, one of our contributors to this program is actually hiding out in the jungle. I know that you know many people who are like that. You alluded to that at the very beginning in your introduction. Um, this is Thet Sui Win, who left the central part of Myanmar, and he's hiding out in the jungle. And this is what he is saying about international community, international help. Have a listen, have a look. We, the people of Burma, we hope and we expect that the international community will do something for us to get the justice. But the international community is still very slow to do it. They fail to take the accountable. They fail to take the, the military to be accountable for what they did. So we, the people, we are only standing by ourselves and we are only working to get our own justice by ourselves. Ali, that's an exasperation. That's we, we're going to look after ourselves. Mm. You, you are not paying attention, world, which I'm sure is why you made the film. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are, as I mentioned before, thousands of people in hiding and, uh, you know, surveillance in Myanmar is nothing new. It's something that uh, was very prominent during the former military regime. And as Thin mentioned, we're now seeing new technology, more sophisticated uh, equipment, which makes it pot the potential, gives the military the potential to do an even more effective version of surveillance. We know that um, when Nin's father also um, had his emails read that that was mentioned in his charges, the documents um, the, of his his charge sheets. So she knows that they've been snooping on him. You know, that these people are at risk and the, the, there's no real end in sight for them. And this is the mm. other thing, you know, uh, the, this growing fear and the isolation of the military, the fact that they're kept separately from the rest of the community, the fact we've seen some defections, but really not the number that you'd hope for in order to make an impact and to, uh, and to, to make the military rethink what they're doing, it's not happening. And what I wanted to draw attention to was the fact that the military are doing this. They are, they are, and they have the capa capability to do more. Uh, and because people don't realize all these people are in hiding, they may be safe now, but what, what's the future for them? When, where do they go and when can they leave? Mm. Wayne, how's your dad doing? What do you know about your dad? Uh, my dad is uh, currently being held in uh, insane prison in uh, Yangon, and he is on trial. He's been charged with hate speech. Uh, we we find it funny because he's the you know he works on uh, peace and reconciliation with ethnic minorities and ethnic armed groups in in the country, and he's been charged with hate speech. So it's quite diabolical and politically uh, motivated charge, of course. So so he's right. currently. Uh, on uh, yeah, we will know when he will be sentenced in a couple of months' time. Okay. Wayne, in, Finn, Ali, thank you so much for bringing the story of Myanmar right to us here on the stream and to us on Al Jazeera. Have a look here on my laptop. This is the film that Ali and the 101 East team have been working on, Myanmar State of Fear, now streaming live online. And you'll be able to see it on Al Jazeera English as well. I'm going to leave you with a statement it's from the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners. We got in touch with them. We asked them what was going on. 
and this is what they told us. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.